Today's lecture, we're going to be covering intracellular compartments of eukaryotic cells and also how intracellular proteins actually get to their proper location, so intracellular protein transport. The first organelle that we're going to cover is the nucleus, and the nucleus is enclosed by what's called the nuclear envelope, which happens to be a double bilayer. And there's some important structural features that a nucleus has, one of which is it obviously contains the chromatin, which happens to be all the DNA and its associated proteins. It also contains a nucleolus, or if more than one, a nucleoli, which is where we see a high site of R RNA synthesis, so ribosome synthesis. And we also have interior fluid that is defined as what's called the nucleoplasm inside the nucleus. And also there's a nuclear matrix that helps support the large organelle. This happens to be a HeLa cell that and its nucleus, and you can see define heterochromatin, which is more darkly dense DNA, it's usually near the envelope, and more unpacked or loosely dense chromosomes um, or DNA is called euchromatin. So that's the distinction between heterochromatin and euchromatin. Some more important features about the nuclear envelope are the fact that there are nuclear pores that actually span span the nuclear envelope to allow for material to come in and out. There are also what is called the nuclear lamina, which helps support the nuclear envelope. You can see here in the diagram the heterochromatin DNA, which is the more densely condensed DNA, which is usually near the nuclear envelope. And you can also visualize here in an actual electron micrograph a nuclear pore complex and the nuclear matrix and heterochromatin um, DNA. So the, the actual membrane itself contains 60 different types of transmembrane proteins that have a lot of different functions for the nucleus. The nuclear pore complex, abbreviated MPCs, essentially can, are comprised of 30 proteins called nucleoporins and ultimately transport or movement occurs through these complexes. So most proteins in RNA are actually transported in and out through these pores. You can see this is a particular surface view taken by an electron microscope that allows you to see multiple pores that are embedded within the membrane to allow for transport across the membrane. This particular diagram is actually showing you movement of gold particles through these pores so that the, the, this process, this movement of a substance, could be visualized using an electron microscope. And this happens to be the gold particles and their movement across a particular pore. So it enables scientists to actually study the movement of something through a pore. Now the nuclear core, pore complex is very, com is very large. It has distinct features, one of which is a basket-like array which sticks out into the interior of, of the nucleus called the nucleoplasm. And there's these fibrils that stick off towards the cytoplasm. The nucleoporins have these domains that are called FG domains, which actually stick out right into the interior part of the pore. And these are hydrophobic domains. They actually prevent diffusion of larger macromolecules through the, the pore. And in fact, anything greater than 40,000 Daltons cannot move through unless it's assisted. And the gating, the gating mechanism actually allows the pore to open. But these um, FG, they are um, phenylalanine glycine domains that ultimately will help assist in the movement of substances across the, uh, across the nuclear pore. Now, in addition to the nucleus, we have many different proteins that are considered part of the endomembrane system. Um, the nuclear envelope is, is considered part of this only because the um, endoplasmic reticulum buds off the nuclear envelope. So the ER, the Golgi, transport vesicles that are going to help move material between the ER to Golgi and to other locations. The endosomes and lysosomes are also components of the endomembrane system. Now, when we think about the endomembrane system, keep in mind that material moves from these components through vesicle formation. So transport vesicles are used to move material from the ER to the Golgi, from the Golgi to the cell surface or to the lysosome. So ultimately, these vesicles will bud off the membrane and then move usually by motor proteins along microtubule filaments 
and then fuse with target membranes. Um, next week's lecture will consist more of what are, how vesicles form and how does fusion occur and ultimately the important components that allow for those two processes. The endoplasmic reticulum, the also known as the ER, has two important subcomponents, which is the rough ER and the smooth ER. And this is an electron micrograph showing you smooth ER. And this is an electron micrograph showing you rough ER. One of the important distinctions between the rough ER and the e smooth ER is the rough ER has the um, ribosomes um, interacting with the membrane, whereas the smooth ER is absent of ribosomes. So that's one of the kind of distinct features between them. However, I'm sure you've le learned that previously. When we think about the structure of the rough ER, the rough ER is a interconnected network of kind of flattened sacs or discs, and we call these cisternae. And it is continuous with the nuclear envelope, and in fact ribosomes are coming on and off this membrane continually, so they're pretty much transiently docking to allow for protein synthesis, and then they actually um, come off. If we look at this particular diagram down here, it's actually um, a protein that's found in the ER. It happens to be an enzyme protein called disulfide isomerase, and it's been tagged with an aminofluorescence tag attached to an antibody, and we can actually see the ER within this particular cell due to tagging of a particular protein that resides in the ER. The ER can be rather extensive through a cell depending on how much particular proteins need to be produced as well as how many how many lipids are potentially produced based um, in the smooth ER so ultimately we can have different amounts of ER membrane depending on the activity of the of a particular cell type when we think about the smooth ER the difference in functions the rough ER is important for protein synthesis and also for modifications such as glycosylation and also disulfide uh, bond formation. The smooth ER, on the other hand, is important for lipid production, and in particular, cells that are important for steroid production, such as uh, endocrine cells in the gonad or the adrenal cortex, they're going to have a high amount of smooth ER, so, they're, so ultimately hormones can be produced in those particular types of, gl of glands. The liver also has a high amount of smooth ER because it's involved in detoxification of various organic compounds such as ethanol, barbiturates, etc. And there are specific enzymes that are ultimately are important for that detoxification. The, e, the smooth ER is also important for sequestration of calcium and we see this in important components of cells for cell communication and other aspects as well. I mentioned that the endoplasmic reticulum, specifically the um, rough ER, is important for glycosylation. So this is one of the first areas in which once proteins are produced, if proteins are going to be glycosylated, so sugars added to those proteins, which we have many different types of membrane proteins that require glycosylation for function. So they could serve as binding sites, they could serve as receptors, um, they could sell, serve as markers for specific cell types on the cell surface. These glycosylated proteins, so proteins that have sugar groups, oligosaccharides, when these proteins are made, these sugar groups will first be attached at, in the rough ER. And this particular diagram is showing you that process for the production of an N-linked oligosaccharide onto a particular protein. And what happens is for glycosylation to be added to a particular protein, such as in the, in the rough ER, is there special um, dolichol membrane phospholipids um, called a dolichol phosphate that actually serves as kind of a donor molecule in which these sugars will be added to. And they'll be added in a particular order based on particular enzymes glycosyl transferases and as more and more sugars are added this phospholipid will then flip to the interior portion of the rough ER where additional sugars will then be added 
in particular in a particular fashion and then finally this oligosaccharide once it's built will then be transferred to the protein and it's usually added to um, asparagine amino acid with a particular sequence and then that protein now will have its um, N linked oligosaccharide as one example of, of a particular oligosaccharide linkage. At this point in time, this protein will then be completed in its synthesis process and then transported potentially to the Golgi, etc. So there's important glyc glycosyl transferases which are going to be responsible for adding these different sugar residues in the REF ER. So not only is the REF ER important for protein synthesis, but also for production of proteins that have particular oligosaccharides attached. Once proteins are synthesized in the REF ER, they're then packaged into vesicles and sent to the Golgi. And the receiving side of the Golgi is the cis Golgi. Material will then be moved through the cis Golgi, through the medial cister um, cisternae, and then to the trans, which is the exit point of the Golgi, and then repackaged into vesicles and potentially moved to somewhere else, such as the lysosome or the cell surface. This shows you the, an actual an electron microgram in, uh, graph image of a Golgi, and you can see that the Golgi is built from stacks of flattened cisternae, and these different cisternae have distinct functions or compartments, and there's usually specific enzymes that reside in each one of these different compartments. This particular image is, is showing you a fluorescent tag protein that is found at the Golgi, and ultimately it helped scientists highlight the Golgi membrane based on tagging a protein that is localized to the Golgi. The Golgi also, just like the REF ER, has glycosylation, and there's specific enzymes that are going to be responsible for that glycosylation. This is just showing you one particular order of glycosylation that could occur in the Golgi, and it's often what happens is certain sugar residues are removed that were added in the REF ER and then modified in such a way that additional sugar residues are added in a particular fashion. So this is just one example of particular glycosylation steps that could occur to a particular protein to modify that, in this case an N-linked oligosaccharide that was added in the REF ER and what could happen um, as far as its modification process. And then ultimately this protein could be then shipped to maybe the cell surface. So to give you an idea about the Golgi complex, remember there are different segments or compartments. The receiving end is the cis, which we call the cis-Golgi network, which is abbreviated CGN. And proteins from the ER are going to be moved to this location first, and then they will move through the medial Golgi compartment and then further through the trans. So one of the important functions of the Golgi complex is, first of all, um, sorting of proteins. So ultimately they'll be then sorted and moved to their proper locations once they're received at the Golgi. And also besides sorting is we also get glycosylation of glycoproteins and glycolipids further in the Golgi. So Golgi is important for sh sorting and shipping of proteins to the various locations as well as glycosylation. This particular diagram down here are images of gold labeled proteins that are found in the Golgi and specific proteins that are found to be in certain compartments of the Golgi. Osmium tetroxide is an enzyme that's found in the cis component of the Golgi and you can see that this happens to be the cis portion due to um, the presence of this particular enzyme labeled with gold particles in that location. The mannosidase 2 happens to be an enzyme that's found in the medial region, which means the middle of the Golgi, and you can see that by this particular diagram and gold labeling. And then the other nucleotide diphosphatase is another enzyme that's more found in the trans, and it identified in this particular image the trans portion of the Golgi. So all these are collected from electron micrograph images that are gold particle 
stained proteins to allow for identification of the different um, compartments of the Golgi, cis, medial, or trans regions. Now, when we think about synthesis of proteins in general on ribosomes, ribosomes can be found in two locations. They either can be synthesizing proteins in the cytosol, or they can be recruited to the ER and continue their synthesis pro um, process at the ER membrane at the rough ER. So when we think about protein synthesis, these are our two sites. Remember that ribosomal sub subunits, the small and large subunits, will not actually interact until there is an mRNA molecule involved. And then they'll come together as a functional unit to allow for translation to occur. Multiple ribosomes can actually attach to an mRNA molecule at once. One will move along to allow for polypeptide synthesis, and another one will come up behind it, and this allows for multiple polypeptide chains to be made from a single mRNA molecule, which helps speed up protein production. This polyribosome is also seen on the surface of the rough ER. Now, for proteins, when they are synthesized to get to their proper locations, proteins contain what are called signal sequences. And different signal sequences have been identified for proteins that need to go to the ER, proteins that need to be retained in the ER, proteins that need to ultimately get imported into the mitochondria, proteins that need to get imported into the nucleus, etc. And these different signal sequences were originally identified by di different sets of experiments where approximate sequences, which are part of the polypeptide chain, were identified, and then were potentially swapped to different types of proteins to see if those proteins ended up in different locations. These types of experiments, these swapping experiments, first of all, identify that there were signal sequences, which are inherent in the polypeptide chain, and also what they were and what that sequence led to as far as location for a particular protein. Now these signal sequences being certain sequences of amino acids oftentimes are found in the end terminus, but not always, and they can be from 15 to 60 amino acids long in the polypeptide chain to help identify where that protein potentially needs to go. Here are some example signal sequences that have been identified that help allow for a protein to get to their proper location. So a protein that needs to be imported into the ER, this is the type of signal sequence that it would potentially have, and you can see it's near the end terminus of the polypeptide chain. Whereas something like C import into the nucleus, it needs what's called an NLS, a nuclear localization signal, and this is a series of five positively charged amino acids and these are acidic amino acids, and that will help serve as a signal sequence for import into the nucleus. So ultimately, proteins need to go to their proper location once they're synthesized inside of cells, and there's different mechanisms for protein import, and we're going to talk about a few of them. We're going to talk about how nuclear proteins get into the nucleus through nuclear pores. We're also going to talk about how proteins get across membranes such as the mitochondria or the ER. And next lecture we're going to talk about how proteins are actually transported via vesicles. So proteins that are destined for the nucleus are called nuclear proteins. And nuclear proteins have to be transported across nuclear pores. And there's some important components that are involved in this transport process. Proteins that need to go in through the nuclear pores from the cytoplasm into the nucleus require special receptors called importins. And these importins are found as dimers. You can see beta and alpha importins, and they will actually pick up a nuclear protein that's been newly synthesized in the cytoplasm. And this protein has to contain an NLS, a nuclear localization signal, which is a specific signal sequence to interact with these importins. These importins are receptors that will interact and help direct movement of proteins through the pores. And these receptors will help mediate movement through those FG domains and then help mediate opening to allow for the protein to enter into the nucleus. Release of that protein from these receptors, the importins, involves proteins called RAN-GTPases, 
and RAN GTPases interact with the receptors, bind to them, and help mediate release of the actual protein into the nucleus. And these RAN GTPases will actually help recycle these receptors back out to the um, outside of the nucleus. We also require receptors to export material out, such as mRNA, ribosomal subunits, and export of material out of the nucleus requires exportins. And RAN GTPases work in a similar fashion as well to help recycle those particular proteins. So ultimately, um, import and export out of the nucleus and into the nucleus require specialized receptors called importins and exportins. And ultimately, these particular receptors will help mediate movement of material through these large pore complexes. Now, this is an energy requiring process, and material that moves out of the nucleus also uses a special nuclear export signal called an NES to help allow for binding to these exportins and their movement out of the nucleus. So proteins that come in or out have to have special tags or signal sequences. Now, movement of proteins across membranes, such as the mitochondria, the transport is a little bit different than transport of proteins through nuclear pores. So uptake of proteins into the mitochondria, first of all, these proteins actually have to be unfolded and these proteins are unfolded due to the assistance of chaperones. Obviously, these polypeptide chains also have to have a special signal sequence that is a mitochondrial sequence. And that mitochondrial sequence will actually get picked up by receptors at the membrane of the mitochondria. These receptors will help direct this polypeptide chain to a translocation channel, and these translocation channel complexes are called TOM complexes. The polypeptide chain will then move through the TOM, a pore of the TOM complex, a channel of that complex, and depending on where that protein needs to go, it can be directed into different locations. If that protein needs to go to the matrix, the polypeptide chain will actually be directed to what's called the TIM23 complex, which found, is found in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and then directed through, and then chaperones will assist in helping pull that polypeptide through the channel as well as help assist in its refolding process. Polypeptide chains that end up inside the matrix also get their signal sequence cleaved by special peptidases that are present inside the matrix of the mitochondria. If proteins need to go into the inner mitochondrial membrane, then they're actually direct directed from the TOM complex into the TIM22 complex, which is shown here, and then folded within the membrane and embedded in the membrane at that point in time. So depending on the lo final location of that mitochondrial protein, their directional movement may be different. Keep in mind you learned early on in the first lecture in your supplemental paper that many of the proteins that are destined for the mitochondria do not are not made actually in the mitochondria but instead are made in the cytoplasm and then directed to the mitochondria even though um, the mitochondria does have a genome most of that material um, over its evolution process has been moved to the nucleus and so um, proteins will ultimately be most of them will be synthesized in the cytosol and then move through these complexes back into the mitochondria so this is a diagram showing you the top, um, topolo um, topology of these various complexes in the inner and outer membrane of the mitochondria. So this is the outer membrane of the mitochondria, and this is the elaborate TOM complex with its receptors helping move proteins through that outer membrane. And then this happens to be the um, TIM23 complex, and a model showing the, the TIM22 complex. And in blue down here are the sh uh, chaperones that are tightly associated with that TIM23 complex that will really, what they think, will help pull those polypeptides through the TIM complex and help assist in the folding process once it's in the matrix of the mitochondria.
So in addition to moving proteins into the mitochondria that need to go to the mitochondria, we also have many proteins that actually have to get imported into the ER. And proteins that ultimately are moved to the ER either are proteins that are going to stay in the ER or move on further, such as move on to the Golgi, move on to the cell surface, move on to the lysosome. But all these proteins will first have to move to the ER membrane. And you'll notice one important distinction in the movement of proteins. Most proteins that are moved to the ER are in their synthesis process. They are still being translated. And so polypeptide chains that are coming off of ribosomes will be recruited to the ER membrane. The signal sequence comes off the end terminus so that poly, as the polypeptide chain is made, that signal sequence will be, um, will be coming off at the beginning of that translation process. This gets picked up by what's called an SRP, a signal recognition particle will recognize that signal sequence and bind to the polypeptide chain and actually will pause the translation process of the ribosome. This will then get moved, this whole complex will then get moved to an SRP receptor and interaction with the receptor will then lead to release of the SRP and also allow for docking of that ribosome onto a, a translocon channel so um, that the polypeptide chain will then be able to be moved through that channel and the ribosome will continue the translation process so that the polypeptide chain will com be completed in its process. Now this is a model of what these translocons look like, these channels that are going to allow for polypeptide chains to move through into the ER or into the membrane of the ER. And some important features that have been identified through X-ray crystallography as well as um, cryo-electron microscopy, which is this is this model on the right is based on uh, cryo-electron microscopy. But essentially, these different models, and um, based on X-ray cr crystallography and um, electron analysis, you can see some important features. One of which is a plug. There's also an important poor ring structure that the um, polypeptide chain is going to move through, and this plug is closed until the polypeptide chain moves through and, and leads to its unplugging. This actually is showing you polypeptide chain moving through the pore of the channel and this is actually the ribosome docked onto the channel of this particular model. So the x-ray crystallography structure was determined using an a, um, archaeal bacterial translocon. Um, ultimately most of the features probably from this bacterial translocon are probably still conserved in higher eukaryotes today. Once a polypeptide chain is, is continued to be made as that ribosome docks on that translocon, um, the proteins that need to go into the lumen of the ER will be assisted by chaperones in their folding process. And this is one example of what's called the BIP chaperone, which is a chaperone that's found in the lumen of the ER. And also, the signal sequence is, is removed by a peptidase, a signal peptidase that's in the lumen of the ER as well. And remember, um, there are also different types of enzymes present that will, at this point in time, will add glycosylation or disulfide bonds. Now, Integral membrane proteins, so proteins that need to go into the membrane, whether they're going to stay in the ER or maybe they end up in the membrane of the Golgi or maybe they end up in the membrane of the cell surface, will fold directly into the ER membrane as the polypeptide chain is being synthesized. And that's what this particular figure is showing you. So this polypeptide chain, as it was being made, um, ultimately ended up being folded into the ER membrane. And then it will be, if it goes on further to another membrane, it will be packaged into a vesicle, delivered to the Golgi, etc. So the main purpose of, of something like a ribosome docking in completing its translation pro process on the ER membrane is the fact that these 
membrane, transmembrane proteins need to fold within a, the membrane environment. So because ultimately there's huge hydrophobic portions. And ultimately these hydrophobic transmembrane segments will come through. They won't be able to be translated all the way through. They'll actually di disrupt that movement of the polypeptide of that segment through the translocon. And then the pore actually opens up and allows slippage or movement of these transmembrane segments to be embedded in the membrane so that ultimately we fold these integral transmembrane proteins within the membrane. Now movement, once these proteins are made in the ER, they're either made in the membrane or fold or move right through into the lumen and folded in the lumen of the ER, they will then potentially be packaged into vesicles if they need to go further and move to the ER. I mean, sorry, move from the ER to the Golgi. And the Golgi, when we think about movement of material through the Golgi from the ER, there's different models of essentially how this material moves once it gets to the Golgi, from the cyst to the medial to the trans areas of the Golgi. And the two different models that have been proposed in the past are what's called the vesicular transport model, whereas all cargos moved from the cis Golgi network all the way to the trans Golgi network only using vesicles, which you can see here. There's another model that's called the cisternal maturation model, and this is where the flattened discs ac actually move as they mature. So it's more the whole flattened disc move as a whole forward as maturity occurs of these different proteins. Now the current model kind of incorporates both of these models. There are cisternal maturation model in the fact that these cistern matures as these bigger portions move forward. However, vesicles move material backwards or what's called retrograde to move enzymes back to those original kind of cis regions medial or trans because remember particular enzymes do reside and are important for the beginning movement middle movement or late movement and so vesicles are going to help really move that material backwards to more less mature cisternae so that you maintain those different sub compartments this particular electron micrograph images are actually gold particle stained enzymes that are identifying um, locations of the Golgi. So this happens to be cargo being moved in, in um, particular regions of the Golgi. And this D is actually showing um, an enzyme that resides in the Golgi. So how do scientists actually study these cytomembranes, the ER membrane, Golgi, movement between these different compartments? And there's different ways in which scientists have actually studied movement or protein trafficking. Um, one such use is using GFP, so green fluorescent proteins. And these green fluorescent proteins can be added to particular proteins and you can watch this particular movement of, a, the, of the green fluorescent protein as it moves to different locations. So for instance, um, a cell could be infected with a particular virus that contains a gene, such as a viral gene, the VSVG VG gene, that has a fused GFP gene to it. So that when this viral protein is expressed, produced and synthesized on the ER, which you can see here, it will get the, um, it will have the green fluorescent protein, which emits green fluorescent light, and it will identify that the protein is being made in the ER, because you're going to see that green protein, which you can see in that first figure A, and then you can also watch as that protein gets transported to the Golgi, later in its time sequence, which you can see in figure B. So this is one way for tracking a protein by tagging that protein with GFP. So a particular protein 
um, a gene sequence for that protein could be inserted with a fused GFP gene. And when that protein gets expressed, synthesized, then you can actually watch its movement process by the fluorescent green protein tag. So green fluorescent protein um, um, tagging is really important, has been very useful in studying proteins as they move um, through different components of the endomembrane system. The electron microscope has also been pivotal to understanding the movement of material through the endomembrane system by using gold particles that can be tagged to particular proteins via antibodies. You can look to see where those particular proteins end up, where they might reside, where they might stay. Do they end up in a vesicle? Do they end up in a particular portion of the Golgi, which we've seen previously in other slides that I've shown you? Um, also, um, images of vesicles have also helped identify structures of vesicles and particularly proteins that help form vesicles such as COP1 in this particular diagram. But it's been important in identifying these different structural features that help form vesicles, proteins that assemble on these vesicles that lead to formation and potentially um, budding of these vesicles from the surface of the ER or the Golgi, etc., or the plasma membrane. Vesicles have also been able to be studied by using differential centrifugation, as cells are homogenized and broken up, membranes, internal membranes of the endomembrane system, such as the ER, etc., will break apart into these microsome fractions, so these smaller little um, circular vesicles. And then by different centrifugation speeds, we can collect particular fractions of these different derived membranes, so microsomal fractions, by performing different centrifugation steps or increasing centrifugation steps to collect different types of fractions so that you can, ultimately a scientist can collect a specific fraction such as from the smooth ER or the ref ER and look at the different pro um, proteins that are found within those different fractions. There are other techniques as well that have been extremely useful in understanding the transport process and movement through these organelles, such as RNA interference. So expression or injections of RNA eyes to interfere with the production of particular proteins can help identify whether that protein might be involved in an important process of vesicle formation, etc. and ultimately it will interfere and you'll see potentially accumulation of vesicles or accumulation of ER membrane because no vesicles can actually form, etc. So different defects that could um, form that potentially could lead to identification of a role of a protein in that particular process. So um, RNA interference is proved extremely useful. Also genetic mutants, yeast and identification of specific genetic mutants um, have been extremely useful in identifying proteins that are important in movement of vesicles, um, fusion of vesicles, etc. So here's a particular example. This is a wild type yeast cell and what the ER membrane and vesicles might look like in a wild type cell. However, this happens to be a mutant that um, is of a protein that's important for vesicle formation. And this mutant no longer produces a, this protein that's important for um, vesicle formation. So what happens is, is this particular mutant has accumulated a lot of ER because vesicles aren't able to leave the ER membrane and move to the Golgi. So now materials accumulating at the ER and you can see a huge amount of ER that's building up in that cell. So mutants such as this are important for helping to isolate proteins that are involved in these processes and if we find a defect or a scientist finds a defect then they can help identify a protein that might be critical um, for that particular function. And this is another mutant that shows accumulation of vesicles and this is because this particular mutant um, happens to be a mutant that of 
of a particular protein that's important for fusion with the um, membrane. And so vesicles aren't fusing with the Golgi membrane. So therefore, we're building this particular cell happens to be building up a, a ton of vesicles and with the absence of fusion. So then this mutant can be potentially um, the genome sequence to identify the particular gene that's mutated and ultimately point to a particular protein that would be important in that fusion process that is defective in this particular yeast cell. And keep in mind, even though yeast is a, a simple single-cell eukaryotic cell, these mechanisms in um, the endomembrane system as far as movement of material from the ER to the Golgi through vesicles, etc., are very tightly conserved in simple to complex organisms. So proteins that are identified in, in these lower eukaryotes oftentimes have homologs in higher eukaryotes as well. So this completes our lecture for intracellular compartments, which should be a review, and ultimately where proteins are synthesized as far as the cytosol or the membrane of the ER, and how we get these proteins to their proper destinations through the use of signal sequences in the polypeptide chain of proteins and the use of specific receptors that interact with these signal sequences at their target membranes or organelles.